I popped into the local DIY store. Well, I say the local one. It's the main sort of big DIY store, B&Q, on the Isle of Man. And I was looking at their Christmas lighting display, and I saw this, and I thought... The most interesting thing about it, the bit that really caught my attention was the number of colours and the way it looked like it was the, the sort of sleeved single colour rope light. And kind of, it is kind of sleeved, but not sleeved. And I took a closer look at it. So this is a, a basically a tale of 12 stars. And it's got the lead coming on at the bottom and the rope light's going around the outside. And then it loops it up to the other end and then it comes back around the other side. Uh, and then comes back down and the end of it's here. So it's one continuous piece of rope light. And when I took a closer look, I noticed that the frame is actually really quite robust. It's a steel frame. Sorry about the flicker there. There is a reason for that we'll talk about in a moment. But it's got a steel frame that's uh, sort of tack welded together. And then, really impressively, the instead of using the round rod, as many of the cheaper ones do for the actual uh, stars and things like that, they've actually got a metal sort of strip. And the strip has been uh, formed round, and then it's been, again, it's been tacked just where it comes along one of the flat surfaces instead of some of the nastier ones that come up to the sharp point and leave a sharp point can actually punch the plastic. So this is quite good. And these uh, stars are all tacked on in such a way that this, the points of them meet together so that the rope light can flow from one to the other. And when we look at the joint of this, you can see that the colour that's been put in this, single colour, it's all white LEDs inside, but the colour that's been put in it has been done during manufacture. This has been, this rope light has been custom manufactured just for this frame. And here's a good, here's a much better vivid example of the transition. So it's going from the yellow to the blue, and you can see that the plastic goes from yellow to a mixed colour green and then to the blue. And initially I did think it was the sort of heat shrink, coloured heat shrink that they sometimes use, but in this case it has seemingly been extruded directly on. That's very impressive, especially if you consider that it changes colour so many times in such a precise manner. And you look at the end where the detail's quite small, and the only bit that it really slips out of sync slightly is they've cheated here. They've maybe gone a bit wide here, and as a result, that's gone a bit further into the other one. And uh, it's worth mentioning that when you're putting rope light on Christmas frames, uh, it makes a huge difference when you pull slack into these tighter bends. It actually uses up quite a large quantity of rope light quickly uh, when you add those extra details. So other things worthy of note. Initially I thought this stuff might be using uh, very long strings of LEDs. I spent a lot of time staring very closely at the frame to the point I probably got a bit of uh, suspicious looks from the staff. But you can see that uh, it does have multiple sections. It's the classic rope light in the sense it's got the little bus bar wires going inside. Then it's got uh, a connection going across to one of the bus bars and then it will, it will basically run round for it turns out to be exactly a metre and then it bonds on to the other bus bar. I think that's one there. And the circuits inside, uh, if you look up very close, you can see there are uh, LEDs in the, the frame and then resistors and it's a quite a regular uh, array of resistors. It turns out that in each meter they've got 18 LEDs which equates to about 60 volts or so which makes that quite inefficient. A lot is being dropped across those resistors but it doesn't matter too much because that's going to have two advantages which we'll look at in a moment. But uh, I've shone a really bright light into this, looked through various colours and worked out the value of the resistors appears to be grey, red, brown, which is 820 ohms, 82 and 1 multiplier, so 82 and 0. Uh, and it's a consistent, it's a, each section is those 18 LEDs and 16 resistors tapped in. So let's go back to the bench now and uh, analyse the circuitry and do the calculations for this and see how they tally up. So back at the bench, let's take a look at how that stuff is constructed and then do the maths associated with, you know, the current and the power dissipation from those resistors. So when you look end on to this stuff, it's got an outer sleeve of plastic which is moulded on after the inner core has been made and populated with LEDs. The inner core has a construction like this. It's got a void like this that then sort of dips up like that. And the reason they've got that little tail at the end there is because they stuff the, the wiring and the LEDs into this sort of void here. It contains all the electronics inside. And then it's closed up at the point like that because then they're going to extrude another plastic coating around it with those multicolors. I just can't go over the fact it's multicolor extrusion in a continuous linear run like that. That is very clever, particularly with, what was it, uh, five colors? 
It was very impressive. When they manufacture this, they also punch nice clean holes. And I know they kind of punch these through because I've seen a machine, I think it was in India, um, on YouTube, which you can see the machine actually extruding it. And then after it's extruded as a continuous sort of tube, it's got a sort of punch going up and down, punching those holes in. Very, very neat. So that's it seen from the end. Another thing down here is you've got a couple of bus bars uh, at the opposite end of this. Now, the if you view that from the side on, it would look like this. So there's the sleeve drawn quite badly, but that's okay. Here's the void going through that's got all the electronics in it. And here are the punched holes through to the outside. And they do seem to be punched right through cleanly. And I'm guessing that is partly for alignment purposes. The LEDs are the classic little Christmas light and LEDs. You know the ones that uh, have the uh, concave reflector? It's the little sort of dimple in the end. And it means that when the chip shines up, it sort of shoots light out in all directions. It gives it a 360 degree vision. The LEDs are pushed into this with that little concave lens like that. So that's a couple of LEDs pushed into those. And one tail of the LEDs in this instance has a resistor soldered onto it. So it's got a resistor soldered onto that. And then the other one, other LED, it's got a loop of wire goes in between them. It's insulated flexible wire. And the reason for that is it makes it easier because keep in mind that they make this wiring loom up in advance and then they press it down. They punch the LEDs down into this and literally tuck all the resistors and the wiring into this strip. Um, then the bring oh, that also incidentally that uh, also because it's a flexible runner wire it means that because the rope light is going to get shaped around really tight bends if you just basically bridged across the solid leads from the leds there's a risk that they'd get fatigued and snapped off with the bending of the rope uh, let me just bring a bit of rope up, up and show you what i mean by that so the rope light has to tolerate really being bent into tight shapes, really mutilated in some of the installation techniques they use for this. So that loose strand of wire inside gives, it gives that certain flexibility. This void, incidentally, is also a bit of a nightmare. The original Tungsten stuff didn't have that void. It was all... It, the Tungsten lamps were punched in and then pins were punched in, but it was all pretty much solid plastic. The void in the LED stuff unfortunately lets moisture travel inside, which is a bit of a nightmare from terms of uh, corrosion, then tracking and flashing over and blowing up rectifiers. But that's just uh, one of those things. If you work in the Christmas lighting industry, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So the... Uh, LEDs are punched into these holes, the resistors are put in line, as many as are needed for a circuit, and then the wire comes off the LED and it loops over, out of that, loops down, and it physically loops onto this uh, bus bar. They must bring that down the outside before they sleeve it. I wonder how they keep it so tight when they're actually moulding it. If you look closely at these, where it joins that bus bar, you can see the bus bar going along this sort of stranded bus bar, you can see where the wire has been put along next to it, and then it looks like something has just spun some wire around it, a little sort of springy effect around it to actually bond them together. It's actually much better than the first tungsten ones, which almost seem to just push a spike in and almost stitch it through that, which they used to be quite intermittent. You used to sometimes put rope light in a frame, turn it on, and there'd be a meter out, and then you'd flex it around that point, and suddenly it'd start working, then it was fine. It wasn't a great approach. This looks really well made. Everything about this looks really well made. It's impressive. I mean, for a cheap product like that, it's absolutely staggering. So let's do the maths now. Have I covered everything? We've got the LEDs down like that. We've got the wiring and resistors just stuffed in here. We've got the wires coming out and down to that. Yes, we have. So they basically have the 18 LEDs starting from one of the bus bars, which is positive, going through all those LEDs and the resistors and then coming out the other end to the other bus bar, which is negative. And you can cut it every meter. There's a void in between. That's another advantage using a small number of LEDs. It means that void is much bigger. Normally the spacing would literally, uh, well, I can show you the spacing. This would be what I'd call normal rope light. And the spacing is about that. 
uh, with uh, the cheaper robe light that they're using, the spacer is more like that. It's actually a much wider space between the LEDs. I prefer the closer stuff. Having said that, the other stuff must be much easier to make with the wider space from LEDs, and it still looks pretty good. So let's do the maths. We've got 18 LEDs, and each of those white LEDs is going to be about 3 volts. So that's uh, 18 LEDs at 3 volts equals 18 times 3 is 54 volts. Uh, we've got, so let's bring the calculator before I make a dick of myself. Here's the calculator, that, that's to save me getting all confused. So we've got a 240 volt supply, but it's not quite as easy because this is an RMS supply. And one of the things about the small number of LEDs is that once the mains has been through the bridge rectifier, it, it looks like that. It's a sine wave that's had the bottom half flipped up. Because they're turning on at 54 volts, that's quite low. So the LEDs are actually going to be lit for most of that sine wave. The only point they're not going to be lit is a very tiny section at the bottom, which means there's a good chance that the, this cheaper stuff that's only got 18 LEDs per meter is going to flicker less. The other advantage is uh, because it's dissipating quite a lot of heat, as we'll find out shortly, it's not super mega hot, but it warms the tube light. And when you get snow build up in Christmas lights, it's actually helpful to have a bit of a... Uh, warmth because it defrosts them. Um, when we were designing some of the Christmas lights uh, on George Square, they had to consider snow loading the extra weight on the wires. Uh, because the Christmas lights were really large, three-dimensional frames, they were prototypes. They were the first in the industry to use rope light. Um, they had to consider what would happen if snow built up in the frames, how much extra weight it would add to them. And in reality, uh, the heat caused all the snow to melt off, which was good except when things went wrong and circuit breakers chipped and stuff like that. But anyway, we've got 240 volts and we deduct the 54 volts across the LEDs and that gives us uh, 240 minus the 240, 186 volts, I believe, uh, to drop across the resistors, to drop across resistors. I didn't need to write that bit out, but I did. So now... We've got 16 resistors in that, times 820 ohms, equals a total value. I'm definitely going to calculate this one. Uh, 16 resistors times 820 ohms equals 13.120K, 13,120 uh, 13, ohms. Okay. So, um... The current then through the circuit is theoretically I equals V over R. So that's the voltage we're dropping, which is 186 volts, 186 volts, divided by the 13,120 uh, 13, ohms. Let's work that out. Uh, we're looking for around about... 20 milliamps or less, 186 volts, uh, 186 volts, yes, divided by 13120 equals 14 milliamps. That's good. Equals about 14 milliamps. That's perfect. Typically running the LEDs at 14 or 15 milliamps results in good output, but a much longer life than running them at their full 20 milliamps. So that means that uh, if the whole section uh, is running, the LEDs and everything is running 240 times 14 milliamps equals, let's work out the power dissipation per meter, 240 volts times 0 0.014 equals, it's roughly 3 point, say 3.4 watts per meter, which is average, you know, that's roughly the same as the stuff that uses, well it's the same current, that, that uses the higher number of LEDs. So now let's work out how much heat's coming off those resistors and how much their dissipation is. So uh, for the resistors, we're looking at the voltage dropped across the resistors. So the resistor dissipation is 186 volts. Sorry if uh, you don't like the maths, you can skip forward. There is, uh, after I've done this, I'm going to actually look at the rectifier ends and the uh, actual bit of the rope light itself. So 186 volts times 14 milliamps equals... 186 times 0 0.014, which is 14 milliamps, equals a power dissipation of about 2.6 watts across 
um, 16 resistors. So divide that by the 16 resistors, divided by the 16 resistors equals 0 0.163 watts. And each of those resistors is actually rated 0 0.25 at worst. So that is well within the rating. It also means that the 2.6 watts, that just provides a very gentle warmth across that. It's going to keep the, the snow from building up in it. It's not too bad. There is another huge advantage of that. Uh, the worst time to be putting rope light on metal frames is when most councils decide that's when they want it done. It's the run-up to Christmas. It's a great job in the summer when it's warm and the rope light is flexible because the plastic is soft and malleable. When it gets to winter, when it's low temperature, the stuff gets creaky and rigid and you're actually putting a lot of strain in it by trying to form it into shapes. So although they say you're not supposed to power it up while you're putting it on the frames, a lot of people ultimately do because it's the only way to make it soft enough to actually shape around the frames. The best time to make uh, and repair Christmas lighting is in the summer when it's warm. Uh, I just want to say that to all the councils that don't do that. So let's uh, take a look at that rope light again and the ends and the rectifiers. A couple of approaches to this. Here's a messy bit of cabling. So this is a professional end by a company called uh, Blacher. Blacher supplied all the stuff for the George Square Christmas lights that uh, Northern Light installed in the, the original, the old coloured display before it went all flat and white. And uh, this was the typical DC end and everything about this was geared up to be used the existing. It was the very first LED rope light materials. And everything was geared on the existing tungsten stuff, so they used the same shape of ends. I noticed that the one in that uh, B&Q frame, the multi-star frame, is much thicker. And I'm guessing that they've done that so they can fit a bigger, bigger, a bigger bridge rectifier inside. This one contains four discrete 1N4007 diodes that have hand-soldered with a little bit of insulation between them onto the back of the connector in here. And it's notable, and this was a huge problem, it's notable that they've moulded the plastic around the rectifier and you've got the, the socket inserts for the actual plug in the rope light into. And the, it's fine that the rubber cable comes down, it's moulded tightly into that plastic, but then they've got this outer plastic sleeve which is designed to glue onto the rope light to seal it against water ingress. And unfortunately, although they've drizzled resin up here, they've tried to fix the problem, it didn't. Uh, water used to occasionally keep down in here and it would seep in with capillary action and thermal expansion contraction. And again, you've got a lot. If you've got a lot of rope light, that hollow core inside can actually create quite a big temperature void. That you know the air expands and contracts, and it does create a lot of pressure difference. It was the curse. Uh, long runs of LED rope light are really not recommended. Short runs, much better option. Um, if you've got a large frame, it's better to have a junction box and then run lots of short sections out of that, preferably with their own fuse. Because when water does get in and it causes tracking between the contacts then to this, it sometimes causes it to flash over in there. And when it does, there's, it's all a sealed space. It will go pop and you'll see a flash. It will then short out the bridge rectifier and that's this end completely ruined. It's just an absolute dead short after that. Makes finding faulty panels very easy. Uh, faulty connections very easy, but uh, it's not ideal. I like this generic Chinese one because they've moulded in line, they've put a much bigger rectifier in here. I've opened some of the non-waterproof ones and I'm pretty sure I've opened one of the waterproof, really picked all the plastic off. And inside was a really chunky, solid, big rectifier rated at least three amps. It's never going to get used at three amps, but uh, it is rated more generously and that uh, saves problems. And that comes in this case to a completely sealed in sleeve here. It's all moulded into the one piece of plastic, so water can't theoretically up the end here, hopefully. And that is the two connections. And the rope light itself, to make a connection, the bus bars, it's got this little adapter. It's got two spikes that go up the end and they pierce up inside the bus bar wires. And you can actually feel it scrunch in. And then this gets glue put in it and it gets put into the socket here, which is a very loose socket, uh, non-reassuringly. Loose socket, that's way too loose. The Blacher stuff at least had the facility that the pins were split pins, so you could actually get a sharp knife and you could just 
put it between the two uh, halves of the pin and separate them slightly so they actually gripped as they went in and made a better connection. Hmm. Another end gets a cap. Notable that if you look at the uh, other end of the B&Q stuff, it's got a little white plastic disc as well. What happens there is the white disc gets put in and it, it means that when this gets twisted, the bus bar wires will actually sort of push in and out the end. And without that white plastic cap, it can actually pierce through the end of this and expose live metal. So the, the one from b and I can't get over that, that how well made that is. Um, so this glues on and seals the, the end of the cap uh, the end of the rope light for safety. Or alternatively, if you're joining sections and every joint is just another nightmare, it's another possible failure point, you get spiking kits that have the two spikes go in this end, the two spikes go in the other end, and a sleeve that should fit tightly. Blachard used to supply these really loose sleeves, they were a nightmare. Uh, we had to source uh, other sleeves ourselves. But then you'd put the glue on them and then you'd push them together and uh, they would seal completely inside and the spikes would actually go up the end of uh, each bit of rope light and it would join them. Not not a fun task, actually. So uh, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is 36 LEDs in it. I wonder, it's also got 820 ohm resistors. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if that's just, I wonder if it comes from the same factory. It's the same type of construction, with the same little wire loops and the LEDs pressed into these sort of recesses. Oh, another thing. The uh, Blacher stuff we got, uh, the very earliest LED rope light didn't have the, re the bits that the LEDs inserted into it. It was just a void, and the LEDs were sideways, and they were just pushed in, because sometimes, depending what happened at the factory, I think a lot of it was manual in the early days of the LED stuff, they would occasionally get a bit out of sync and the LEDs would be sort of randomly spaced. It was basically down to someone sitting at a bench just pushing all these LEDs and wiring into that before it went through the outer extrusion. I'd love to see that outer extrusion machine, the one that actually does five different colours, because it's seamless. You can feel a very slight ridge where the colours change, but it just blends from one colour to the other in a very short space. I wonder how they do that. That is very impressive. No air bubbles or anything. So let's... Uh, Let's just finish by doing the maths. It's going to be a bit more math, sorry, for uh, this stuff. So uh, this stuff has yellow LEDs in it. Um, can I power this up? I could power this up. You're not going to be impressed because yellow is one of the shittiest colours for LEDs. Let's plug it in. Can you even see it? It is yellow. It's not very bright at all. A bit of shimmer there as well because of the uh, mains frequency and also the fact there's more LEDs in series. So it'll be a slightly higher voltage, but uh, let's uh, let's uh, leave this here. Let's do the calculations. So we've got 36 LEDs, LEDs, in this case at 2 volts each. And that equates to about 72 volts, is it? Uh, 36 times 2 equals 72 volts. So to drop across the 240 volt supply minus the 72 volts, 240 volts minus, uh, minus 72 volts equals, we've got 168 volts drop to drop across the resistors. So how many resistors do we have? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 resistors. So 14 resistors, 14 resistors. Now, what I was saying about that loose end, all it takes is the slightest movement to make that flicker on and off. It's not a good connection at all. Uh, so we've got 14 resistors, said Clive, smudging the ink. Um, and interestingly, they've put them, they start off every second uh, LED and then it goes to every third LED. They must just uh, have a machine that manufactures the looms and it must just adapt it to the colour of the LED, it's forward voltage. So 14 resistors times, uh, they were 820 ohm again, grey, red, brown, 820 ohms equals uh, 14 times 820 ohms equals this time it's 11,480 ohms. So let's cu calculate the current. Um, 
168 volts being dropped across the resistors, 168 divided by the 11,480 ohms gives a current of approximately 14.6 milliamps. So let's round it up, let's say 15 milliamps, which means that for every meter of this, uh, well, we'll just use that existing number times the 240 equals 3.5 watts. It comes within that sort of typical 4 watt rating per meter of LED rope. That's an interesting thing, the Blasher connector there actually says it's for 0.9 watt a meter. I wonder why that is. Strange. Some of them came through saying 4 watt a meter and some came through saying 0.9 watt a meter. Very odd. I never came across the 0.9 watt meter stuff. Um, some of the rope light originally came out, they used very long strings of LEDs. You couldn't cut it every meter, you could only cut it every two or every four meters, and the 0.9 watt might actually be stuff that's spread across a full four meter section. Not very handy when you're trying to fit it into detailed frames. Uh, so, calculating it, let's calculate the power dissipation of the resistors, just, as a, just because we can, basically. So it's 168 volts across the resistors times the current uh, 0 0.015 equals 2.52 watts divided by 14 resistors 0 0.18 watts per resistor, which is again well within the 0 0.25 rating of the quarter watt resistors. So the resistors aren't really being pushed. So, uh, in short, the, that Christmas light, as I've mentioned repeatedly, the one with the stars, I'm very impressed at its construction. I just can't believe that they, they extrude the colour onto that in runs, and then it matches the frame absolutely perfectly. They must just, that frame must be made in a jig. It must be so standardised, the shape and size and measurements. Everything must just be mass produced, and they must have, by trial and error, got the machine that extrudes the colour out. Just, it must have parameters, I'm guessing electronic, and it just goes by distance and then it injects the next colour. And there's just that short transition period. It's very impressive. I'd love to see video of that. But in short, uh, I'm very impressed in that frame. Very, very impressed. Uh, it's just really robust for something that is a consumer grade product. I think that uh, because it's made of steel and it looks like it's powder coated, it's not got quite the resilience of the commercial grade aluminium frame ones that you see mounted in lamp posts. But for home use, I would say, and the fact that you can re-rope that if you want with another eight meters of the color of your choice, just a single color, uh, makes that actually quite a very intriguing device. I may actually re-rope that at some point. It's very good.